Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us tonight. We want to invite you to be turning with us to the book of Exodus chapter 16. We've been working our way through the book of Exodus over the past few months and we pick up tonight with Exodus chapter 16. As always, if you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, if you have some way that we can help you, if there's something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me an email at info at fourlakeschurch.org. You could also send me a text or give a call to 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you. You could also comment uh, in the comment section on tonight's class. Last week, I mentioned that we would be meeting on Friday evening or afternoon to help shovel some crushed stone around the new church sign and around the beds and the border surrounding the church building. Several of you stepped up and shoveled and shoveled and shoveled on Friday. And I would mention uh, the names, uh, but I don't want to mention them on the live stream tonight. But uh, thank you to those of you who helped. Thank you for doing that. Uh, it looks good. We got it done just in time, just a few days before the snow started to fall around here. So thank you very much for helping with that. Well, tonight we are back to the book of Exodus, and tonight we're in Exodus chapter 16. So God has delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. They have now crossed over the Red Sea on dry ground. And last week we had the Song of Moses as well as the Song of Miriam. And then at the end of chapter 15, we had the people run out of water after three days, and God supplied them with fresh water there in the wilderness. So tonight then we move along and we pick up with Exodus chapter 16. So let's jump right back into it tonight, picking up with Exodus chapter 16, verses 1, 2, and 3. Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Then they set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departure from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Well, just a few notes here, starting with the reminder that the wilderness of sin does not refer to some kind of immorality. So that's not what we're dealing with here. Sin was not sin like we think of today, but sin was a place. This is what they called this place back then. And there is still some debate to this day as to where this place actually was. It was somewhere, we assume, near Mount Sinai. And we may think, well, that settles it. And yet there is also some debate and speculation concerning the location of Mount Sinai. There's no sign that says, welcome to Mount Sinai, that has survived from ancient times. And so that's kind of up in the air. There are some good theories. There's like a good first and second place kind of theory there. Um, but there's also some speculation, some debate concerning the uh, location of this uh, wilderness of sin. And so it doesn't really help us too much. As far as we're concerned, the people are in the wilderness. That's about all we really need to know. And wilderness, by the way, we should point out, does not always mean desert. Uh, a lot of times when we think of desert, what do we think of? We may think of miles and miles of nothing but sand. Maybe a few cactus uh, here and there, extreme heat and the sun beating down. And uh, wilderness, that term may include a typical desert, but it is certainly not limited to what we think of when we think of a desert today. A wilderness is simply a place that is undeveloped, a place that is uninhabited, far away from civilization. And so these people are now traveling through the wilderness. And the other thing to note here is that we have an update to our timeline. If I've understood this correctly, they are now about a month and a half into this new adventure. So this is the 15th day of the second month after their departure from Egypt. You may remember the Passover when they left Egypt, that restarted their calendar. So that was then January 1st to them, we would say today. So they are now uh, halfway through that second month. So that kind of plugs us into the timeline. And so here we are, six or seven weeks in, the people are grumbling against Moses and Aaron now a second time. You may remember in our review, we learned that they grumbled concerning the lack of water. That was at the end of Exodus 15. Well, obviously, water is a number one concern. And now they're complaining about the food. And, of course, they are being over-the-top dramatic about it, aren't they? Uh, in their complaint, as they confront Moses and Aaron, they say they wish that God had killed them back in Egypt. Because at least back in Egypt, they had pots of meat, as well as all the bread that they could eat. So a meat and bread buffet. 
Uh, for some reason, I think of the all-you-can-eat breadsticks at Olive Garden. Some of you are fans. Uh, those are pretty good. Uh, I haven't had those for a number of years now, probably since before the pandemic. Um, but the same goes for Fazoli's. I don't think we have a Fazoli's in Madison right now that I know of. And I don't even know if they're in business anywhere anymore right now. I, I just don't know. Uh, but I, I do know that I wish I could have some hot Fazoli's breadsticks again. Those were amazing. But this is what they miss out on in the, in the wilderness. They miss the meat and they miss the unlimited supply of bread. If you can imagine being in the wilderness for a month and a half, you're out there um, 40 days and 40 nights. Kind of an interesting uh, parallel there, roughly. Um, but they miss the bread. They miss the giant pots of meat. But notice they don't mention the slavery, do they? They don't miss that. They don't mention the harsh treatment that they were experiencing. They forget about crying out to God to get them out of that place. Uh, they're just remembering missing the meat and the bread. And certainly the climax of this complaint is they accuse Moses and Aaron of bringing them out there into the wilderness for the purpose of killing them with hunger. What a ridiculous accusation. Of all the ways to kill people, I'm thinking that starving someone to death would be a huge hassle, wouldn't it? If you just look at it from that point of view. I mean, it would have been much easier to drown them in the Red Sea. It would have been much easier just to leave them in Egypt. Uh, but this is the accusation. You took us out here just for the purpose of starving us to death. And so the people, once again, uh, they are rebelling against God's appointed leadership through their whining by complaining to God, uh, rather to uh, Moses and Aaron, concerning the lack of food. So let's continue then with Exodus chapter 16, verses 4 through 7. Exodus chapter 16, verses 4 through 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them, whether or not they will walk in my instruction. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the sons of Israel, At evening you will know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your grumblings against the Lord. And what are we that you grumble against us? Well, we don't have Moses talking to God about this. I don't know if he just skips writing about that, but it seems to me as if God hears the complaint. He overhears what they're saying to Moses and Aaron, and God steps in and he answers Moses directly. And notice in this passage, God's plan is to rain down bread from heaven to fix this problem. There are so many ways that God could have fixed this. But instead, he plans on dropping bread from heaven. And he tells Moses that he will be doing this as a test. And so there are going to be some instructions tied to the dropping of the bread. And God will be watching to see how the people react and see whether they obey. And the instructions are to gather a certain amount every day, but they are to collect twice as much on the sixth day. And that's all we're told here. We aren't told the reason for this at this point, but we're simply given the instruction. We're given the command here. Well, Moses and Aaron turn around, they convey this to the people, they explain that whatever's about to happen will prove to them that the Lord is responsible for bringing them out of Egypt. In other words, the exodus from Egypt is not random. Uh, this is not something they accomplished through their own awesomeness. They didn't fight their way out and overcome the Egyptians, nothing like that. But leaving Egypt was literally an act of God, and what's about to happen next will uh, further confirm that. And then also notice how Moses and Aaron mentioned that God hears your grumbling against the Lord. And that right there is a reminder for us that when we complain, God hears those complaints. And we may think those complaints are, are being made against the leadership here on earth, and they are. But those complaints in many cases are actually, if we're being honest, are being made against the Lord. And to me, Moses and Aaron seem at least a little bit exasperated here. And what are we? that you grumble against us. What have we done to deserve this? They seem to be at their wit's end here. And when we try to put ourselves in Moses and Aaron's place, uh, in their shoes or in their sandals, so to speak, I think we may understand these two men did not ask to be leaders of these people. If you remember, Moses was minding his own business, living a fairly comfortable life, caring for the sheep out in the land of Midian, and if you remember, God has to pretty much harass him into returning to Egypt and confronting Pharaoh. This is not something that he wanted to do. He had to be talked into. He had to be convinced. So Moses didn't campaign to be some kind of elected leader. He didn't run for this position. 
but he was certainly reluctant to say the least. And besides, what could Moses possibly do on his own at this point to feed two to three million people in the wilderness? If you go and complain to me and you're like the city of Chicago and say, hey, we don't have food, well, what am I going to do about it? We're in the middle of nowhere. We have two to three million people. So who do we think we are uh, to solve this? Uh, by the way, I was looking up, uh, we're going to get to the amount of food that they were to collect later. But uh, I kind of asked Google earlier today, um, how much food does an average person eat today in weight? And uh, Google says that we eat between three and four pounds of food a piece. Can you imagine how much food that is? If we're talking two to three million people times uh, several pounds of food per person, we're talking millions upon millions of pounds of food. We're talking barges. We're talking uh, multiple freight trains full of food on a daily basis. Well, this is God's problem to solve. Moses is merely the lightning rod for these complaints. Well, let's continue then with Exodus 16, verses 8 through 12, the next paragraph. Exodus 16, verses 8 through 12. Moses said, This will happen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and bread to the full in the morning. For the Lord hears your grumblings, which you grumble against him. And what are we? Your grumblings are not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumblings. It came about, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the sons of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the grumblings of the sons of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Well, in verse 8, Moses basically repeats what he just said. In verse 7, he tells the people that the Lord will give them meat in the evening and the all-you-can-eat bread buffet in the morning. This is new information. But then he repeats the reminder that the Lord has heard your whining. And you people need to leave me and Aaron out of this. We are not the reason why we don't have bread. Take your complaint directly to God. So Moses then has Aaron repeat this to the people. There is apparently some repetition when communicating to 2 to 3 million people. Uh, I can only imagine that challenge. As a camp director, when we uh, had around 100 people on the campgrounds at a time, you know, I would make an announcement, and not two minutes later, I would almost have some kid come to me and ask what I just said. Wait, wait, are we going canoeing today? Well, yeah, I, we just had the canoeing announcement, that kind of thing. You know, so everybody might hear the announcement, but not everybody is listening to what is being said, and that's a challenge uh, apparently throughout history, and it's a challenge that Moses is dealing with here. Well, they get everybody together, they make the announcement, and as Aaron is speaking, they look out into the wilderness, the glory of the Lord appears in the cloud. God explains to Moses that his miraculous provision of food would happen at twilight for the meat, and then in the morning for the bread. And the purpose is not just to feed them, it's not just a physical need being taken care of here, but the purpose for this is so that you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Well, let's continue with Exodus chapter 16, verses 13 through 21, the next paragraph. Exodus 16, verses 13 through 21. So it came about at evening that the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness, there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground. When the sons of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it every man as much as he should eat. You shall take an omer apiece according to the number of persons each of you has in his tent. The sons of Israel did so, and some gathered much and some little. When they measured it with an omer, he who had gathered much had no excess. And he who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. Moses said to them, Let no man leave any of it until morning. But they did not listen to Moses, and some left part of it until morning. And it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. They gathered it morning by morning, every man as much as he should eat. But when the sun grew hot, it would melt. Well, that evening the quail come in. These are birds. And this takes care of the meat situation. They didn't even need to go hunt. They didn't even need to go looking for birds. Where do you go looking for birds with two to three million people? But it sounds like the birds just dropped themselves all over the camp every night. So all they had to do was, was lean down and pick them up. 
And so also the next morning, when the dew dries up, it leaves behind this fine dusting of this flaky bread-like material. And when they see it, they ask, what is it? So this isn't like the bread that they had in Egypt. It was different. Uh, these are not Fazoli's breadsticks. This is not Olive Garden. This is proof that God has provided for them. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. I know we sing that song sometimes still today. Uh, but since they've never seen it before, Moses has to explain that they are to only collect an omer at a time. Only enough for each person in every tent. They are forbidden from saving any leftovers. And as I understand it, an omer is just over about two quarts, so just over half a gallon, roughly uh, two liters. If you can imagine a, a two-liter bottle of soda, that's roughly what we're talking about here. This would have been enough bread for one person for one day. Well, some ignored that command to not save any until the next day. You know, and I kind of think, why would you save some till the next day? And I think most of us understand why, because we don't know if this is going to happen again. And if we've gone several weeks without any consistent food source and we're told to collect only enough for today, I think in the back of our minds we'd be thinking, what if this doesn't happen again? And so we'd be tempted to save some, and they do. And they, their bread broke out in worms. It got nasty in a hurry. Moses gets angry at this. You know, sometimes leaders may have rules that don't make sense at the time. You know, this did not make sense. Why can't we save bread? We, we save stuff all the time. Well, this was designed as a test. And some people here obviously failed this test. Well, let's continue with Exodus 16, verses 22 through 26. Exodus 16, verses 22 through 26. Now on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. When all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, then he said to them, This is what the Lord meant. Tomorrow is a Sabbath observance, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake, and boil what you will boil, and all that is left over put aside to be kept until morning. So they put it aside until morning, as Moses had ordered. And it did not become foul, nor was there any worm in it. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. So now we have some more detail concerning the sixth day. On day number six, they are told to collect two omers instead of the one. And it seems as if the people are wondering why. And so they come, they tell Moses about this. Moses explains the seventh day is to be a Sabbath observance, a holy day dedicated to the Lord. And this is the very first reference, I believe, to the Sabbath anywhere in Scripture. And this is significant. Because as far as we can tell from Scripture, the Sabbath was only given to the Jewish people. We have no reference to the Sabbath being a, a thing at all at any point prior to Moses here in Exodus chapter 16. So as far as we know from the Word of God, Adam never kept the Sabbath, Abraham never kept the Sabbath, Isaac never kept the Sabbath, Jacob never kept the Sabbath, none of the sons of Israel ever kept the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was only given here as a command at the time of Moses. Now, as we'll find later in Exodus, the Sabbath was designed to remind the people that God made the universe in six days and rested on the seventh. And that right there is reason enough to believe that God actually did what he said he did in creating the universe and everything in six literal days. It's expressed in this command to keep the Sabbath. But I'm just saying we have no record of the Sabbath ever being observed at any point prior to Moses. And I, and I say that because sometimes people today will say that we need to keep the Sabbath today. Um, but the Sabbath was only for the Jewish people, only under the law of Moses. It was never given uh, all the way back to the beginning. Well, in the second half of this passage, the people obey the command to collect twice as much on day six. And it doesn't become foul like it did for those who collected and saved too much on days other than day six. And so that proves that God was behind this. By the way, concerning proving that God was behind this, some have said, well, you know, there were plants out there in the desert that would secrete this stuff that would sometimes land on the, and so, you know, on the ground, and, and that was simply a natural occurrence. Remember our discussion we had a few weeks ago about the crossing of the Red Sea? Well, there's this random wind that would come up, and the Red Sea was six inches deep, and it would just kind of blow the water aside, and they thought it was a miracle, even though it really wasn't. Well, kind of a similar thing here. A lot of times people will say they were just collecting stuff that was left on the ground. God really had nothing to do with that. But no, notice the, the part that proves that this is miraculous. First of all, it wasn't doing it. God told them he would do it. Then it started doing it. And the other thing is 
it didn't do it every seven days. And so that is part of the miraculous nature of this, proving that this is, in fact, from God. You would not find that weekly schedule uh, on a natural basis. So let's continue tonight with Exodus 16, verses 27 through 30. Exodus 16, verses 27 through 30. It came about on the seventh day that some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you bread for two days on the sixth day. Remain every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. So now we have this exception. So just as some gathered too much and it rotted, so also now some ignored the command to collect double on day six. And they went out on day number seven and they couldn't find any bread. In my mind, I have in my uh, mind a, a picture of a teacher explaining something to the students. You are going to need to know this in the future. And the kids don't listen. It goes completely over their heads. And then they're totally shocked a few days later when they don't have what they need to complete the assignment. Kind of a similar thing going on here. And, um, and what we may find interesting is that uh, God confronts not those who ignored the command, but God confronts Moses over this. And so Moses, as the leader, gets called out by God when some of the people seem caught by surprise at the lack of bread on the Sabbath. And so this command is repeated, only now there seems to be a new twist. They are just to stay home on the Sabbath. Just don't even go out. And just make it simple. We're going to tweak this command a little bit. Just don't go out. Stay home. And uh, through this, the people learned to rest on the seventh day. So let's conclude tonight with Exodus chapter 16, verses 31 through 36. Exodus 16, verses 31 through 36. The house of Israel named it manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and its taste was like wafers with honey. Then Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer full of it be kept throughout your generations, that they may see the bread that I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar and put an omer full of manna in it, and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. The sons of Israel ate the manna forty years until they came to an inhabited land. They ate the manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. Now an omer is a tenth of an ephah. Well, at the end of this chapter, we get back to the name that they gave the bread. Remember when they first saw it. The people woke up in the morning, they saw this fine, flaky substance on the ground, and they asked, what is it? That's a natural question. Well, as I understand it, manna is basically the question, what is it, in the Hebrew language. And so when they saw it the first time, they said, manna? And, uh, and this is the name that sticks through the years. And in fact, for the next 40 years, this is what they'll eat and this is what they'll call it. We're going to go pick up our what is it every morning. Well, obviously Moses is writing this after the fact at the end of the, these 40 years. Now he's looking back to where it starts and telling us about it. They eat manna every day for 40 years until they get to an inhabited land, or Canaan, which is also known then as the promised land. In verse 31, we find that it looks like coriander seed. Uh, coriander is, as I understand it from my research, basically another name for cilantro. Uh, some of you are big fans of cilantro. Others of you hate it. It seems like nobody's really uh, ambivalent towards cilantro. Everybody's got a pretty strong opinion one way or the other. Uh, so manna then, it didn't taste like cilantro, but it looked like the seed pods, uh, the seeds on cilantro, those little spheres that could be ground up and then turned into flour used for a number of purposes. But instead of tasting like cilantro, uh, thankfully for some of you, it tasted like wafers and honey. So now we're talking about the uh, those uh, honey butter rolls from... Oh, what is it, Texas Roadhouse? Uh, those are so good. So I'm thinking manna probably tastes like that. Bread from heaven dropping uh, on the people. Well, in verse 32, we find the Lord commands that they keep a serving of the manna permanently. And so not only would it last through the seventh day, but this jar that they keep would, would keep uh, permanently so that future generations would know that God had provided for the people in the wilderness. And, and here's the evidence. They were to put it in that jar, they were to keep it, and they did. Ultimately, they put it inside the Ark of the Covenant. But at this time, they haven't even been told to build an Ark of the Covenant. They don't even know what that is. 
Uh, they've got the raw materials pretty much gathered together. They just don't know what they're about to use them for. That command is coming later, and it's coming in the very near future. Pretty soon they're going to have a place to keep that sample of manna. Well, this brings us to the end of Exodus 16. In terms of practical lessons, I think we've seen yet another case of whining. And we've learned a few things from this one. I think it's important that we complain to somebody who has the power to fix what we're complaining about. Other than that, it's just gossip, and that, that's terrible. Um, so it's best then, I think in most situations, to go directly to the Lord for help first, instead of whining or complaining to somebody who really doesn't have the power to fix that situation. Um, again, if you have questions, if you have other uh, practical lessons tonight, feel free to share that in the comments. Feel free to let me know. We can mention that uh, next week. Uh, Abe, one of our members, uh, pulled me aside, I think it was this Sunday, and just spoke about something that he noticed from the class last week, and that is just the value of water. And the fact that today, especially here in the city of Madison, we have what we perceive to be a virtually unlimited supply of fresh, clean, cold water, don't we? We have awesome water. And you may argue, well, it's not what I like or, you know, different taste. We have water. That right there is an amazing blessing that we don't always appreciate. And yet, if it were to turn off for three days, I think most of us understand we would come to appreciate it very quickly. So let's be thankful for our blessings, thankful for our bread on a daily basis. Again, if you have questions, any comments or concerns, if there's some way we can help, if there's something we need to be praying about, something we can do to encourage you, uh, get in touch. Send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can send a text or give me a call at 608-224-0274. We would love to hear from you. I think tonight I'm going to um, uh, close class and learn how to trim my lamp. If you notice that flickering, most of the class, hope it didn't bother you too much. And I'm just glad we haven't burst into flames quite yet. But uh, thank you for your attention tonight. And as we close, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the one and only true God, the one who provides for us. You are the one who provides and takes care of our every need. You give us our daily bread. And sometimes, Father, we get uneasy if we can't see exactly where every meal may come from. But we pray, Father, for greater faith to trust you in everything. Thank you, Father, for clean water. Thank you for the food that we eat. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for giving us extra so that we can share it with others. We pray that you would help those who are struggling today with the basic necessities of life. There are many people all around us who are in that situation, not knowing where each meal may come from. And so, Father, we ask you for opportunities for us to help. Bless our efforts to provide soup for the children at Schultz Lewis. As you know, Father, many of these children have no one to turn to for help. And so they have turned to you and to your people. Father, we ask that you will bless us and use us to help in any way that we can. We come to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our King. Amen.